Hello, I'm Dr. Adam Green. I'm a pediatric neuro-oncologist at Children's Hospital of Colorado and an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. This presentation today is designed to educate primary providers who take care of children uh, in the timely diagnosis of pediatric brain tumors. This program is based on the Head Smart Initiative, which was developed by another pediatric neuro-oncologist, Dr. David Walker, at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And so what we're going to talk about today uh, are signs and symptoms that um, patients and their families may come into your office with, uh, and they may be concerned for a brain tumor, or you may uh, be concerned for a brain tumor based on their symptoms. And so we're going to go through um, how to approach that visit and different um, key symptoms that they may have and how to um, handle those, how much suspicion you should have for a pediatric brain tumor, um, how little suspicion you should have, and uh, how to approach the patient in these situations. Okay, so let's first talk about the general approach to uh, a visit where, again, you or the family may have concerns about the possibility of a brain tumor. The initial symptoms of pediatric brain tumors um, can be pretty nonspecific, and so in that they can match um, uh, many more common childhood conditions. So brain tumors should never be the first thing you should think of, um, or very rarely, uh, because they, they may match um, you know, much more common conditions that you see in the office. It's also important to note that the symptoms of pediatric brain tumors can fluctuate. Um, and that could include symptoms that uh, completely resolve and then can recur later. So it, it's not like uh, the symptoms need to be you know, linearly increasing over time. Um, another important uh, thing to know is that a normal neurologic exam does not exclude a pediatric brain tumor. It's important to ask about um, related symptoms uh, to the chief complaint. Um, and some key things to assess uh, are uh, vision, uh, motor function in growth, um, and one important aspect of growth in less than two-year-olds would be head circumference, as well as the patient's pubertal status. Okay, so now let's talk about some different symptoms uh, that patients may come in with and how to approach them. So headache is a classic uh, potential symptom of pediatric brain tumors and one that can really make patients and families concerned. It's important to know that headaches in the setting of pediatric brain tumors rarely occur in isolation. So it's important to assess for other symptoms. One thing to remember is that children who are less than four years old will usually not describe their headache as a headache. They may be fussier than usual. They may describe other pain or just be unhappy, describe abdominal pain, but are somewhat unlikely to describe a headache. But their increased fussiness is the equivalent of a headache in that age group. It's also important to, to note that many patients uh, you know, have headache syndromes um, and that are not due to brain tumors and they can then develop brain tumors. So it's important to reassess patients with known headache syndromes if they have a change in the quality, frequency, or other aspects of their headaches. In terms of when to image patients with headache, uh, we would want you to image if um, those headaches are persistent and waking them from sleep at night or occurring upon waking up in the morning or are associated with symptoms like confusion or are persistent and associated with other symptoms like nausea, vomiting, um, vision, uh, neurologic changes in their exam or endocrine symptoms. Um, so uh, again, a headache, really any headache that's, that's uh, uh, associated with confusion or if the headache is persistent and associated with these other symptoms. And when we say persistent, we're really talking about over a couple of weeks. The next symptom we'll talk about is nausea and vomiting. Again, a very common symptom that uh, children and teenagers will come into the office with. We get concerned about the potential for a brain tumor once they're out of that you know, kind of period where it's most likely to be infectious in etiology. So if that nausea and vomiting is lasting greater than two weeks and um, it's not associated with other infectious symptoms or pregnancy, really important to think about in, in adolescent females, um, if the nausea and vomiting is occurring, again, on, on waking up from sleep at night, um, or if it's uh, associated with other symptoms, including, like we talk, just talked about, headache, visual symptoms, um, increased head circumference, or changes in their neurologic exam or endocrine function. Those would all be um, situations in which we'd be concerned about the vomiting um, and would recommend um, doing head imaging for that patient. Next, we'll talk about uh, an increase in head circumference. So 
this is something that we you know, measure in children usually less than three years old longitudinally. If that head circumference is rapidly increasing, so crossing you know, kind of multiple percentile curves very quickly, that would be an indication to image that patient. But also if the head circumference is increasing more slowly, so crossing percentiles, but in and is associated with other symptoms uh, like we've talked about, such as nausea, vomiting, increased fussiness, or change in the neurologic exam, those um, two situations would be ones in which we'd want um, to get imaging on that patient. This image here shows a axial CT image of a um, child with hydrocephalus of the lateral ventricles. Next we'll talk about visual symptoms. So these are another common uh, chief complaint for children. We want you to consider a brain tumor, again, if these symptoms are lasting greater than two weeks. And that's kind of a common time frame in which we'll you know, start to get concerned if the symptoms are common or are a little bit more subtle. So it's important on your exam to assess pupils, assess visual fields, assess the patient's extraocular movements, and if you can, try to get uh, a, you know, a look at their discs. So uh, in the top two images here, uh, on the left we have an image of papilledema, um, and on the right we have an image of optic atrophy. It's always good to assess the patient's visual acuity in both eyes as well. You can make a referral to an eye specialist if the eye exam is difficult, especially at that fundoscopic exam. And if you have a pediatric ophthalmologist available to you, um, that's always a good option because those are specialists who are you know, used to dealing with kids and uh, you know, aware of the signs and symptoms uh, that can be associated in the eyes with pediatric brain tumors. And stay in communication with that consultant uh, to follow up um, and see if further workup is necessary. We would recommend imaging if you note that the patient has new papilledema, um, if you're noting optic atrophy, and again, those may be noted by your ophthalmologist or optometrist as well, um, new nystagmus, a reduction in the patient's visual fields, proptosis, which is shown in the image on the lower right there, extraocular movement paralysis, which is shown on the lower left there with the abducens nerve policy, or decreased acuity in a patient that's associated with other brain tumor symptoms. Again, headache, nausea and vomiting, or often endocrine dysfunction because um, the, you know, the endocrine system is in the hypothalamus and pituitary are um, co-localized with the optic uh, pathways. In terms of assessing uh, patients with motor signs and symptoms, it's important to compare to where that patient has gotten in their developmental pathway. Um, so ask about changes in their um, learned gross and fine motor skills. A change in handedness in a patient who has um, already developed handedness um, is always a concerning sign to us as pediatric neuro-oncologists. And again, that two-week parameter is very important. So we would recommend imaging if uh, a patient has persistence over two weeks of motor skill regression, a change in their gait so it, it becomes abnormal or, a, or a abnormal coordination, a focal weakness uh, in, in a particular part of their body, um, any difficulty swallowing, um, or if they're holding their head in an abnormal position, um, so a head tilt which is shown in this child in the image there, um, which tends to occur um, when children have problems with their extraocular movements that lead them to tilt their head so they can line up their um, visual fields in a way that they avoid diplopia. Let's now talk about growth and endocrine symptoms. So um, the concerning signs uh, for pediatric brain tumors in terms of growth are a failure of growth or delayed and arrested puberty. Um, and then in terms of endocrine symptoms, that would include polyuria and polydipsia, um, obviously would need to rule out diabetes in that case, uh, galactorrhea and amenorrhea. Um, so follow the height, weight, uh, and head circumference of patients. And um, if they are you know, really way outside the normal range uh, or again are rapidly changing, those are concerning signs to us. Um, again, since the pituitary is co-localized with the visual pathways, assessing the vision of the patient um, can really be helpful in increasing or decreasing your suspicion um, for a brain tumor uh, in the case of growth and endocrine problems. And we recommend imaging um, if your endocrine and growth uh, symptoms are associated with another brain tumor symptom, um, and that would include vomiting. Behavioral issues are another uh, common cause of visits to the pediatrician or a family practitioner. 
Um, and these can be really difficult to separate out uh, in terms of um, their, their cause. Uh, and they're somewhat rarely associated with brain tumors, but they, um, in certain cases, you know, they do raise our suspicion. So um, what would uh, raise our suspicion would be um, new mood disturbances, withdrawal, disinhibition, or lethargy, um, especially lethargy, obviously. But with the other symptoms, um, it's important to assess for um, related symptoms and ask about the context of that behavior. So um, for example, um, for a child who is usually very happy and active in school and is now uh, withdrawn um, or disinhibited, um, you know, that would raise our suspicion. Um, so getting a context for that behavior in a comparison to their previous handling of that situation is very helpful. It's important not to attribute, you know, kind of all mood changes and disturbances to normal teenage behavior or psychiatric causes without assessing for other symptoms. So it's again, it, it's again important to um, assess related symptoms, examine the patient, and get a sense of their, if there are other signs and symptoms of childhood brain tumors that uh, may raise our suspicion in conjunction with these uh, behavioral symptoms. So let's summarize a little bit about um, how to handle um, uh, visits where um, you or the family may have suspicion for um, pediatric brain tumors. So if caregivers ask about the possibility of a brain tumor in their child, um, you can explain to them why it's a possibility or less of a possibility using a support tool that's part of HitSmart that we'll go through in a minute. Um, one other important thing is to get a family history and really ask about predisposing factors for that family. Obviously a family that has a strong history of um, child and young adult cancer or um, uh, a history of um, cancer predisposition syndromes that um, are associated with brain tumors such as neurofibromatosis, type 1 or 2, uh, leaf romini syndrome or tuber sclerosis, um, those would raise your suspicion a lot more for the possibility of a brain tumor. Um, it's important to um, be aware of and try to mitigate challenges that some families may face in terms of access to care and their access to the medical system um, because we know that these um, disparities are associated with diagnostic delays um, in pediatric brain tumors. So if they need language support, try to use an interpreter to try to understand the full story. Um, and if they ha are having problems as accessing the medical system in terms of their insurance, financial status, um, or um, you know, distance from the me medical center, um, try to help them with um, follow-up to make sure that uh, um, their referral and their diagnosis happens in, a, in as timely a way as possible. Um, if you have a suspicion for a brain tumor um, and that suspicion is strong, uh, uh, we are always available to talk with that day and are help, uh, happy to talk with you about next steps in workup um, and to um, you know, help determine um, uh, what's needed and, and the level of suspicion that's appropriate. Um, and when you refer a child uh, for um, further workup, either to an ophthalmologist or um, for imaging or to uh, a neuro-oncologist, um, we want that child to be seen within, within two weeks, again, so we can make that diagnosis and get that child um, started on treatment, if appropriate, as soon as possible. If you do recommend imaging, uh, we would say that an MRI with and without contrast of the brain um, is the modality of choice to evaluate for a brain tumor. If that's not available to you um, either at all or in, in, a, in a timely way, you know, kind of in that two week time frame, um, a CT without contrast is a very reasonable option that can then be followed up later uh, with an MRI if needed. Um, if you're imaging to evaluate for a brain tumor, again, um, it should be done uh, within four weeks at most, ideally two weeks, and that time frame really depends on your level of suspicion. Again, if you're dealing with a child who is um, you know, a acutely ill or acutely symptomatic, um, you can always send that child to the ED or talk to us and, and we will talk, you know, we're happy to advise on the time frame for imaging. Um, ideally, uh, imaging in this setting should be interpreted by a pediatric neuroradiologist um, who is experienced in the, in the diagnosis and assessment of childhood brain tumors. Um, and our pediatric neuroradiologists at Children's Hospital Colorado are always available for um, consultation um, or uh, you know, sending images uh, to um, help radiologists who uh, are in the community. Um, 
One thing that we know is that the need for sedation um, to get appropriate imaging should not be limiting. Um, sedation, uh, especially when it's done by uh, experienced providers, um, is very safe um, and has very few complications and we f uh, feel in general the, the benefits of um, sedation to get appropriate imaging for um, diagnosis of a, a pediatric brain tumor outweigh the risks. But again, a CT uh, of the brain can be done very quickly. Um, and so if there are, again, limitations on the ability to get a patient sedated for MRI, a CT is an appropriate first step. So to summarize what we've been over today, um, the symptoms and signs of pediatric brain tumors can often mimic you know, other more common childhood conditions. And it's really uh, most important to follow up on those symptoms that you may be concerned about, um, to try to get a sense of the whole picture of the child and a full exam to look for associated symptoms that may um, you know, raise our suspicion. Um, and when you're suspicious uh, for a pediatric brain tumor, feel free to reach out to us um, to get that child image and to refer them to um, consultants who, who may be possible. I'm now going to show you a little bit about the resources available on the HeadSmart website, uh, which again was the basis for um, this talk today. So this HeadSmart website has some helpful resources uh, that um, have more information about the approach to the diagnosis of pediatric brain tumors that we just talked about. One of those resources is at the top here. It's the decision support tool, and we'll look at that in a minute. There are also some uh, full guidelines um, from uh, pediatric brain tumor specialists uh, that led to the recommendations that we talked about today. Um, and there are some uh, downloadable resources uh, that have um, kind of short versions um, and guidelines uh, that we talked about today as well. Let's look at the HeadSmart decision support tool very quickly. So the decision support tool has uh, links to all of the major pediatric brain tumor symptoms. Um, and so if we click on one, let's pick headache, it has categories of um, symptoms and signs in terms of when to reassure patients and families um, that their symptoms are unlikely to be uh, due to a pediatric brain tumor. Uh, when to um, see that patient back or refer them to a specialist, and when to recommend uh, imaging um, and further workup. And it also has some helpful hints about um, uh, diagnostic pitfalls that they can get in the way of a timely diagnosis and um, uh, ways to approach the examination uh, of your patient and um, features that may raise your suspicion for brain tumors. Um, to contact pediatric neuro-oncology or other specialists at Children's Hospital Colorado um, any time of the day or week, you can call our one call service at 720-777-3999. And um, feel free to email me at the address listed uh, with any questions about this presentation. Thank you very much for your interest in this topic and all that CARI provide to children in Colorado.